Our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Jesse Logan, uh, and he will be talking about gypsy moth risk assessment in the face of uh, changing environments, uh, case history application in Utah and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. <coughs> Jesse uh, received his BS and Masters from Colorado State University and his PhD from Washington State University. <coughs> he was uh, on the faculty at Colorado State for 10 years and then four years at Virginia Tech working on gypsy moth and then for the last 10 years of his career he worked for the Forest Service here primarily in Logan I think all the time here in Logan and in fact we worked together for a few of those years he uh, retired in 2006 and I understand it's a pretty good gig so and he presently lives in immigrant Montana and uh, I give you Jesse so Thanks, Dale. Sure. Always uh, welcome a chance to visit Logan, be back in Logan, kind of the home stomping grounds. Uh, and I also, whoops, uh, appreciate Dr. Uh, Dilly's talk. Uh, of course, the, uh, the changing environment that I'm going to talk to is uh, global warming, climate change. And I really enjoyed his talk. Uh, but there's uh, something that maybe wasn't exactly correct. If you remember, uh, towards the end of the talk, there was a picture of all those red trees with the idea that maybe uh, what was killing those red trees, mountain pine beetle, would move into the higher forest. And that's not exactly uh, right. Those, that is a high elevation forest. That picture was taken in 2004 by Jeff Hickey uh, near Avalanche Peak in a white bark pine forest, the highest elevation forests uh, on the continent. And uh, those trees are dead. And in fact, over much of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, uh, the white bark pine is uh, being lost. Eco and ecological functionality of white bark pine is going to be lost uh, in the next few years. And these predictions, uh, or this event, was really a surprise. As recently, as uh, the millennial, the National Biological Survey did a survey of biological resources of the, of the continent in 2000. The chapter on white bark pine didn't even mention bark beetles. However, our modeling work uh, back in the 1990s based much on the same sorts of things I'm going to talk today about gypsy moth projected with the uh, global warming models and the climate projections of that time, this event uh, was very possible. Like Dr. Gilly says, this isn't a, a prediction, but a projection. And our models uh, had the projection that this could occur in the greater Yellowstone. In fact, we, uh, it is occurring. It's no longer theory. It's happening, and it's driven primarily by uh, climate change. Also, uh, there was an, uh, the, the, photograph, or the uh, slide that followed that was the connection of pines all across the continent. And in fact, that also is occurring with mountain pine beetle moving north uh, into now uh, jack pine from lodgepole pine. So things already are underway as a result of uh, global warming. And while no one has a crystal ball, including myself, the best guess that we have are putting together these physiological models and trying to project what they might mean with the projections of the GCMs and, and the uh, climate models. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about with respect to gypsy moth today. Uh, gypsy moth is an introduced uh, species, uh, species that came in from uh, Europe, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a little greater detail just in a minute, but the life stages are across the top. Uh, the female, which happens to be flightless, is uh, <coughs> on the upper left. Uh, the uh, right picture is the important piece, that's the larval uh, feeding stages and that's of course responsible for the defoliation that is shown in this uh, lower picture. This is one of my uh, sites in Shenandoah National Park back when I was at Virginia Tech and this is not uh, fall, this is in uh, the middle of summer actually after uh, the larval defoliation of an oak forest in Shenandoah. So this is the type of uh, impact that this creature can have. So, very brief introduction. 
uh, as I mentioned, it's an introduced species, and uh, with most introduced species, they kind of just sneak in. You know, you, you, all of a sudden there's something unusual going on, people look, and lo and behold, there's an organism that hadn't been or wasn't native to that area that's causing some real issues. And with introduced species, of course, they come in without, typically, uh, without their uh, natural uh, enemies that, that moderate the population. But with gypsy moth, we know exactly when and where uh, the introduction occurred and who did it, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> Leopold Truvelo, up there in the upper left, uh, was a, a, a professional artist, but he was also a, an amateur uh, entomologist, lived up in uh, Massachusetts, and uh, in the, the latter half of the 1800s, the uh, textile industry in Massachusetts was suffering, uh, suffering pretty serious decline, so Trouvelot had the idea of trying to start a silk industry in, uh, in New England to uh, come in and, and replace this textile industry. And he had the idea, uh, gypsy moth is of the same family as silk moth, to bring in some gypsy moths and uh, see if he could get gypsy moths going producing silk. Unfortunately, at this house, which is still standing, I've seen this house in Medford, Massachusetts, uh, back when it, this was uh, a few years ago, but it looked very much, there had been an addition built out on one side. But anyhow, Leopold uh, Trouvelot was working in this house, uh, with, with, it had some gypsy moths, and either in 1868 or 69, it's not exactly clear, and either he knocked him out of a window or he had a colony in his backyard that escaped. At any rate, he realized that this was really a serious issue. He notified the uh, Department of, or uh, what was then the authorities in Massachusetts, and said, you know, I think there's maybe going to be a problem here. Uh, I'm sorry, and that's the last he messed around with entomology. In fact, he became a very well-known uh, astronomer. He uh, went to work for the Harvard uh, Observatory and combined his artistic abilities and, and produced a fabulous uh, set of paintings of celestial observations he's very famous for. Uh, shortly before he is, his death, he moved back to uh, France, and uh, coincidentally enough, that year, uh, there was a major outbreak of gypsy moths in the Boston area. And uh, this lower photograph is taken at Amherst, uh, on the University of Massachusetts. These guys are up getting, destroying egg masses of gypsy moths. So that, they said, you know, things are happening, we're going to try this. They probably couldn't do that with OSHA regulations today. But, uh, you know, it was a, a, an event. We know when and where it occurred. Medford, Massachusetts in 1868 or 69. The spread of gypsy moth, as I mentioned, as a flightless female, was really pretty slow. Uh, in the next approximately 40 years, you know, it just really colonized the area pretty much right around Boston. By 34, it had expanded pretty much throughout the New England states. Not much expansion until 65, which is interesting, has some interesting history behind it. By 94, you know, this was the distribution of gypsy moth. So, you know, if we have an organism with a, with a distribution in uh, North America that looks something like this, and it extends on up into Canada, but the U.S. distribution looks like that. Why are we concerned about gypsy moth uh, as far as an Aspen Symposia in Utah? And the reason is, if we take a look at the survey data from 1991, we see the distribution, and these are from gypsy moth traps, and you have a, a key down here, but there's the, the sort of the distribution, but we see all over the country there are positive uh, catches of gypsy moth, including right around Salt Lake City. There was a serious uh, introduction that would, had, had uh, occurred a couple of times, but one was the early 90s around Salt Lake, and there was a massive effort to eradicate gypsy, gypsy moth from that introduction, which was successful. So, you know, how uh, does this flightless female and so on? Well, the reason is the female is really indiscriminate with where they oviposit. Now, this is a, a shot of containers uh, on a, a, in a port, and there's a gypsy moth egg mass that's in that containers. And this is really an important issue that I'll address later with respect to the Asian gypsy moth. But uh, also uh, travel trailers, things like that. Here's another egg mass on the uh, wheel of a trailer. So people are responsible for transporting these eggs all over the country. So gypsy moth introductions occur time and time again. Uh, 
the basic question of any introduced species, gypsy moth included, is, is an introduction potentially damaging? And I've already spoke to the issue of defoliation, the serious defoliation that occurred. What is the likelihood of introduction? Well, with the previous slide, you see that gypsy moths are transported all over. We take a look at the West, where are people moving? Uh, not only uh, massive numbers, millions of visitors each year come from areas where there are gypsy moths into the western U.S., but also people are moving here, and when they move here, they transport the egg masses along with them. So the third question is, if a, a, an exotic species is introduced, what is the probability of becoming established? And that's what I'm really going to speak to today. There are lots of native hosts in Utah and throughout the West, including Aspen. Uh, Aspen and Gamble's Oak are both preferred hosts. Uh, gypsy moth has a very wide host range that it'll eat almost anything that's green, but some uh, tree species are much uh, better as far as the gypsy moth is concerned than others. Both Aspen and Gamble's Oak are uh, favored the, the top category. They're really good for gypsy moth. Maple is somewhat less, uh, can survive and reproduce on maple, but it's in the second category. But for sure, Aspen and Oak, and all the Oaks, uh, and I'll speak a little bit more about this as well, but there are lots and lots, you know, large areas of native forests that are host to gypsy moth in Utah. Gypsy moth gets introduced every year somewhere in, in Utah, detected or not, I'm, I'm convinced of that, but it hasn't become established in Utah. As I say, there was a one, you know, there have been uh, some real efforts at eradication, but they've been successful, and the unknown, many unknown introductions have you know have come to naught. So the question is why, and that why is based a lot in climate. So we have a, a dilemma really as far as detections. First of all, you don't want yet another exotic pest impacting western forests. But on the other hand, you don't want to be uh, spending resources that are limited responding to something that may something that may or may not be a serious pest. So how can you address this issue? One of the ways is through mathematical models. And at the time I was back uh, at VPI, as Dale mentioned, and my primary research effort was with gypsy moth. Uh, and at that time, uh, a real concern as far as expanding its range into into the Appalachian area. And we, we put, uh, one of my things that I did as a, as a professional scientist was put together mathematical models of insect life systems. As far as the gypsy moth life systems are concerned, I don't have time to, to go into the detail of the models, but a student of mine, David Gray, who was working with me and Bill Ravlin at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, did a really nice uh, project looking at the physiological basis for diapause or the overwintering resting state of gypsy moth and came up with a good predictive model for diapause. Work I was involved, involved with with uh, Dick Casagrande and uh, Andy Liebhold looked at the development of the larval stages. We start to put these together in some sort of mathematical model that's driven by temperature or weather. And uh, we put together a model of the life system of gypsy moth. And all this has been published in the reviewed literature. David's uh, egg development diapause model, the larval and pupil development that I was involved with, along with Kathy Sheehan, uh, who looked at uh, the uh, pupil stage. And all of this was put together in a paper by uh, Jacques Rainier and uh, uh, Alex uh, Sherov that came out in 98. Uh, but anyhow, this is the basis, the physiological basis of the model that we're using to address issues about climate. So the, the, uh, the way the model works and what I'm going to talk about was uh, we looked at the probability of establishment based on three w uh, weather criteria. First of all, there had to be enough cold in winter to break diapause. Secondly, there had to be enough thermal energy in summer to complete an entire life cycle in one year. And third criteria was that the adult emergence had to occur at the right time of the year, at an appropriate time of the year, a time when there was a fresh a flush of foliage coming on uh, where the, uh, the uh, our eggs could be laid so the following spring uh, the eggs could hatch with the spring flush for the larval to have a food resource. So these three criteria 
enough cold uh, in winter, enough warm in summer, and appropriate uh, seasonality of the uh, life system. So based on these three criteria, then we could uh, compute adaptive seasonality. And the way we did that, if all three conditions were met, then we say it's adaptive seasonality. If any one of these conditions is violated, it's not going to work. The gypsy moth is not going to become established. It has to really have all three of these criteria. Uh, the, uh, then we let a model run with an with a observed weather pattern for 20 generations, and we look at the end of the 20 generations to take, take care of transients to see if these three conditions have been met. If they have been met, we say it's a one. If they haven't, all three haven't been satisfied, it's a zero. And then we do that for a large number of uh, sampled weather years given a, a climate, say 50 years, and we take the proportion of those 50 years in which the model predicts persistence of the gypsy moth. And uh, then we can say that's the probability, that proportion is the probability of establishment. So that's what's going on. But that <coughs> is just for a, a, a particular uh, point or observed weather pattern. We all know that forests exist in uh, spatially complex environments. Uh, as a shot along Skyline Drive, my, uh, one of my study areas when I was at, at Virginia, and of course uh, this is looking at the north slope of the Uintas. Being a Westerner, when I went uh, back to uh, Virginia for those few years, I thought this is really going to be a key piece of cake modeling the, the climate in, impacts on these little mountains. As it turns out, it's just the opposite. The subtleties of these little mountains are really more difficult to model than the, the really uh, major uh, overwhelming uh, elevational impacts of the West. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, the idea is how do you take this point observation and spread it across some landscapes where forest occurs? Along that line, uh, and we were addressing this issue, I had a Swiss postdoc uh, post working with me, Lucas Schaub, and uh, at that time, we were, th we were really overwhelmed by the issue of taking this to a landscape. Uh, and the idea was to do a simulation uh, on essentially a pixel by pixel simulation and build a map in the same sense as you do a DEM. But that just becomes computationally overwhelming. You can't, you know, you just don't have big enough computer. And even if you do have a big enough computer, all you have to do is ask an issue on a larger landscape and you no longer have a large enough computer. But Lucas, as far as I know, uh, and, and maybe it, it's not the, uh, the first approach in modeling, but in, uh, in entomology, I'm pretty sure it was, said, well, you know, we really aren't asking uh, what's happening on this landscape. We're asking the, the issue on the response of an organism that covers the possibilities on the landscape. So his idea was to do a simulation over an elevational range represented by the landscape, use a simple uh, model. At that time, we were just using a lapse rate model. Run the model over the all possible elevations in the landscape and come up uh, with an uh, algebraic fit to those predicted uh, occurrences and then use that algebraic expression to actually build the, the map. And that becomes a very efficient way of spreading things across the landscape. And uh, Jacques Rainier, a Canadian forest entomologist, moved to Virginia uh, did a sabbatical for me, un unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it. I got a job in Logan and at about the same time Jacques arrived at uh, Virginia Tech with a sabbatical, but he and Lucas worked together and that was the beginning of a system called Biosim that is a, a way of expressing these types of models across complex landscapes and it really works well. It's much more sophisticated than we first started back in the early 90s as far as weather prediction and uh, it, it's a uh, a good system that's been under development since that time. It can be downloaded uh, from Jacques' website. So, uh, and it's very general. It takes any sort of temperature-driven, uh, weather-driven model and expresses it across the landscape. So that's the mechanism we use. The databases, uh, this is gap data, uh, distribution of the three hosts I mentioned, Aspen, Maple, and Oak uh, in Utah. Uh, climate change scenarios, we uh, use both the Hadley model and the Canadian Center model. Typically, uh, the, um, with the simulations I'm going to show, are using the Canadian model. The problem with the uh, GCMs is they're, they're global in scale, and the issues we address ecologically are really uh, local or more of a, of a watershed uh, scale. 
there was a project uh, with the uh, uh, called DMAP project, which was a consortium of uh, several uh, groups that came up with taking the issue of climate predictions from the GCMs and downscaling them to ecologically meaningful scales. And at the present time, or well, the VMAP data is one kilometer square grid, and I'm going to show that in a second. Things have progressed beyond that. Uh, uh, it's a half degree, pardon me, a half degree in latitude. So it's a half degree grid. The current work is bringing these sorts of ecologic predict predictions down to one kilometer scale grid for the entire U.S. And I was hoping to have some simulations with this finer grid by uh, this uh, talk, but I, I didn't uh, have it. The, uh, so anyhow, we use the VMAP uh, weather data to, to drive our, uh, our weather predictions. The uh, weather data itself is daily uh, maps min. We do the simulations on a four hour time step, fit a sine curve to max min. Uh, the, the 0.5 arc degree I mentioned. Uh, the historic and transient data based on uh, 1895 when we had started to have pretty reliable records. And then projecting forward to 2100. Uh, and the, the scenario, scenario we're looking at is, is typically one half percent uh, per year increase in, in uh, CO2, which leads to a doubling rate of about 70 years. And that, that you know, that's been titled the, the uh, business as usual scenario in the IPCC reports. And as it turns out, it's uh, actually we're uh, producing more than the business as usual projections from the IPCC. So this is actually conservative. Uh, so the, uh, anyhow, those are the databases. We have a distribution of host species. We have weather models. Uh, we have a climate uh, change model. To get an idea of the, the resolution of, of the actual observed climate stations, these are the, the circles are the typical NOAA stations. Uh, in the 70s, the snow tail uh, uh, system was initiated and uh, the snow tail sites in Utah are represented by the stars and then this VMAP grid. So we used all three sources of weather to uh, drive the model. Uh, the thing I've described really takes a DEM, a digital elevation model, and it's a translation, a transformation, maybe uh, not exactly, uh, it's a fairly complex transformation, but you take a DEM and actually transform that into a map of probability. So that's what this would uh, look like for the state of Utah. On the left we have the DEM, and on the right we have a, a map of uh, probability of establishment for Gypsy Maw. And uh, the whole process in more detail is described in a paper that came out last year in Ecological Applications, if you're interested. But when we start to apply that sort of modeling mechanism for the state of Utah, first of all, almost all host uh, Aspen and Oak are in NCDC regions four and five. Uh, so when you look at what's happening with temperature, with mean annual temperature in regions four and five, uh, you see that uh, since about 1975, there's been significant warming in the West. And what's that are in Utah? And what that means as far as uh, gypsy moth probability of establishment, if you take a transect that pretty much runs right through uh, the major host species and look at elevation and latitude, in 83, there were very few sites that had a high probability of establishment. But if we look at 2003, there are many more sites that then have the uh, a high probability of the station. So as this warming is being expressed, the area becomes larger and larger across this transect that is uh, acceptable or where the probability of gypsy moth coming established uh, is increased. And I won't go into uh, the climate, particularly talking uh, following Dr. Gilley's talk, just to point out that this trend is not just in Utah, this is mean annual temperature for the 11 western states, it all follows anywhere you go in the West, we're seeing it. And this uh, slide was presented a couple of times in Dr. Gilley's talk. Uh, the West is warming more than elsewhere. So this is occurring. What's that mean as far as gypsy moth? We'll see on the upper left, this is the proportion of Aspen that has less than 50% probability of establishment. Uh, the pie chart here represents that. And, uh, I'm going to start stepping through time from 1915 to 2100, and you'll notice there's variability uh, in the first part of the, the time step where 
Uh, this pie will move back and forth a little bit. The area of green aspen on the on the uh, map will also change slightly. Just point out that you know in the in these earlier uh, scenarios, the uh, the amount of aspen was fairly small that uh, where gypsy moth could become established, and it tended to be just on the fringes of the asp uh, aspen distribution. So go ahead and start this. And as I said, you'll see you know growing and shrinking of these areas of green aspen until 75 or so. So, so that's what our, our model predictions are. Compared to current climate, roughly uh, 2005, the area at high risk changes dramatically, uh, is projected to change dramatically by end of century and is in the process probably of changing right now. So as a consequence, uh, to summarize very quickly, there's not enough thermal energy typically in the distribution of aspen under the current climate for gypsy moth to become established. It's just too cold. Uh, by mid-century, that's going to change uh, dramatically, and uh, what the impact of this defoliation on aspen uh, could be remains to be seen. As far as oak, uh, the uh, thermal requirements for the current distribution of oak are, are met. Oak typically is in areas where uh, thermally it's suitable for gypsy moth. Why is a gypsy moth with these multiple introductions occur? Uh, become established in oak uh, because it's too dry. The gypsy moth is really a pretty measly adapted species. And as Dr. Gillies pointed out, this idea of what's going to occur with climate change and temperature, there's almost uh, all the models are projecting the same thing. Maybe the, the magnitude of warming uh, may differ from model to model, but all the models project it's going to be warmer and we're seeing that in the empirical record, of course. With precipitation, uh, that's it's much uh, less of a, a, a consensus. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot what might happen. But if uh, precip precipitation, particularly spring precipitation, uh, increases and becomes more mesic in these oak habitats, they'll also become favorable. And of course, oak is really a great uh, conduit into aspen distribution in uh, in Utah. And uh, working with these maps, you can set any level of probability for establishment you wish as a, as a manager uh, when a, a gypsy moth trap, trap detection is made. And, and you can treat it like any other sort of uh, GIS data uh, layer. Talk about a couple of uh, examples of application here in Utah. Uh, back in, uh, I'm thinking it was like 2000, uh, 2002, when the, uh, the Rainbow Family of Living Light held their annual festival in the, on the north slope of the Uintas. But at any rate, there were large number, uh, numbers of people, uh, you know, the number of uh, people attending, depending on the source, uh, was maybe uh, pushing 10,000 people, but there were pre- uh, festival preparation and then clean up afterwards. For most of the summer, there were people from a lot of different places that were at the, uh, at the Rainbow Family Gathering. And uh, there were a couple of gypsy moths placed after the gathering. And sure enough, uh, they picked up gypsy moths. Adult, uh, the uh, gypsy moth traps are a sex attractant trap, which pulls in the female. So they uh, picked up two, two positive gypsy moths uh, catches there. There's a, a response from USDA APHIS when you get a positive uh, trap catch, then there's a, a very aggressive uh, grid set out with delimiting traps. And anyhow, this was uh, done for the, uh, in, in that area at you know, a fair expense. So the question is, what is really the, the chance of this, of introductions in this area being a serious event? Uh, the simulation indicates that, you know, it's a long way from any susceptible aspen, given it, it must have been 2003 when that occurs. This is simulation for 2003. You know, it, it's really nothing to be concerned about. It probably wasn't necessary to go into this delimiting 
uh, tracking event and the expense. You know that uh, it really was uh, not a threat as far as uh, Gypsy Moth becoming established. However, if we project forward to end of century, we see that the two trap catches are at point on contour lines that happen to be at 0.9. Uh, probability of establishment and 0.8 probability of establishment. So if this sort of thing happens down the road, it could be a really serious, uh, a really serious consequence for Aspen. 2004, uh, there were two positive track catches, one in the Salt Lake City metropolitan area. Of course, the prevailing winds carries the, uh, the dispersal mechanism for this. Uh, I mentioned the females flightless. The main dispersion is passive wind dispersion of the small instars. Prevailing wind carries it uh, right into the uh, Wasatch Front. Uh, this was potentially a serious event because of you know all the uh, ornamental plantings and it could get a start and uh, be carried into into Aspen uh, and oak. Uh, the distribution of oak and aspen shown here, uh, and I mentioned the conduit of oak right up into Aspen. If we take a look at this. Uh, site uh, that's fairly close to Park City. It occurs in an area of intermediate, uh, you know, the high is, is high probability. This is an intermediate uh, probability of establishment, but it's close enough to uh, Park City. It's probably uh, not overly uh, concerning, but it bears, you know, following up. So probably delimiting trapping uh, would occur there. So. With this tool, we can evaluate what the real seriousness uh, is of introductions that are going to occur, and uh, as I, you know, pointed out, that becomes more serious as climate warms. We can also use the model uh, to more effectively uh, structure eradication programs. The the compound that's used for spraying gypsy moths. Once, uh, once it's established is uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, has a fairly short lifespan. And we can predict when the map, and the target is the first instar lardy, we can predict the uh, Julian date when first instar, maximum first instar is, so sprays can be more uh, efficaciously applied. At the present time, they just do blanket spraying, but they have to do it a large number of times because the first instar to, to catch them all. So we can use the model to more effectively uh, structure programs once it becomes established. And of course these layers can be uh, ported into other uh, GIS delivery systems that are really meaningful for local population. This happens to be Google Earth. But what I'd uh, like to uh, point out is the use uh, to establish uh, efficient survey trapping. Why trap in areas with a very low probability of establishment? Uh, focus efforts in areas with higher probability of establishment you can evaluate the seriousness of trap recoveries, divine, uh, design efficient delineation trapping, and finally, uh, the application I just mentioned of uh, better de design for spray applications. I will briefly speak about the Greater Yellowstone. It's where uh, a place near and dear to my heart. I live right about there. Uh, you can see with, uh, with probability of establishment over here, most of the Greater Yellowstone under current climate it's not very likely that gypsy moth will become established. And uh, they do run a trapping program in Yellowstone National Park. And, you know, every few years, every other year, probably on average, gypsy moths are picked up near the, the popular campgrounds, uh, Mammoth Lake, places like that. And always, by USDA protocol, delimiting uh, traps, grids are set around these recovery areas. But there's really, you know, very it's very unlikely gypsy moth would become established in the, uh, under current, current climate conditions. But when we change this to like mid-century, we see that things start to happen, and particularly in the riparian areas, and I'll focus in on that a little bit. At the present time, about the only major campground where gypsy moth could become established is uh, the Mammoth Hot Springs area. But if you project that towards uh, mid-century, you can see all this riparian area the greater of uh, the Yellowstone River and if you're familiar with uh, uh, Hell Roaring, Slough Creek, uh, on up to Soda Butte, following down the Lamar and the Yellowstone itself, all these riparian areas become very high probability of establishment, become a really a serious issue. And of course, uh, not only Aspen occurring in riparian areas, but 
uh, both narrow leaf cottonwood and all, essentially all the willows also are in that most favored food resource for gypsy moss. So there could be really serious implications for the riparian areas. If we take a look at the south of the eco, south, southern part of the ecosystem, uh, down around uh, Teton National Park, it becomes even more uh, uh, pronounced the effect of projected warming by mid-century. And one thing I will point out in all our modeling work, our models have been uh, too conservative. Things have happened faster than uh, we have anticipated for a variety of reasons. And uh, I would anticipate the same might be true with Jackson Mall. So is there a general value of this approach? It's expensive, uh, you know, and it's hard to pick species that might be introduced. But there are some examples like the Asian gypsy moth, which has a female capable of flight, is being introduced on the west, on essentially all our ports, is, a, is definitely uh, a candidate uh, for this sort of approach. So with that, I'll finish. Yes? I have one question. Um, if I understood it correctly, Dr. Logan, you said that, that currently um, the gypsy moth risk is just kind of around the edges of the aspen. And as, and as the climate warms, that that risk becomes um, greater. Did your model take into account the fact that, that aspen um, establishes itself now because of moisture and temperature? And as the climate changes, that it's likely to change its position on the landscape. No, no, we haven't addressed any issues like that. Uh, and that's really an interesting uh, application. I think this sort of modeling approach could really be, you know, could be a piece of a much larger question that you're addressing. But you need to have the, the model of the Aspen establishment and that sort of thing as well. But it, could be, it would really be a fun thing to do. Yes? Uh, well, you'd have to have the parameters for forest tent caterpillar, and that was really an interesting issue. My, when I was working for the Forest Service, my job was uh, mountain pine beetle. I was project leader of the mountain pine beetle project, so this was sort of just continuing my work and, and done uh, off to the side, but I've always really been interested in forest uh, tent caterpillar and the resilience of aspen to forest tent caterpillar defoliation. When I was a kid, I grew up in southern Colorado, and down in the Canales River, there was this beautiful Forest Service sign that said, the dead forest in the background had been killed by tent caterpillar. And of course, in the background is this beautiful green aspen forest, you know. So aspen is really resilient to defoliation, but if you add another defoliator on top, you know, that's a question for you guys that are doing aspen physiology. You know, wh how, how may that impact the system, and how much defoliation is really required before you start to lose aspen? So, interesting, interesting issue. Yeah. Has, has, has your model included um, the community and how the biophages could really affect the biophages? No, it doesn't. I, that was something I, I should have addressed uh, in kind of running through this. But uh, gypsy moth, the European gypsy moth, is, is really pretty easy uh, adapted. And we set out uh, in this work with Steve Munson, set out egg masses in a wide array of places in Utah. And what we found in places like St. George and where there's really a, a moisture stress that the egg would hatch, but the uh, larvae would be desiccated on the egg mass. So, so available precipitation is really important. And I was alluding to that in what has, happens with oak. But uh, that's not included in the model at the present time. It would be a, uh, an important thing to look into. Nice research question. <laughs>